Hello, what is up guys? Evil Lewis Arm here today, back with another astronomy video. In today's video, I'm gonna be showing you the upgrades that I've made to my system and setup here for taking astronomy photos that you may have seen in my Discord, on my Instagram, or somewhere like that. Show you all the different upgrades I've made to my system, how I was able to get these different pictures, how I did some processing and all of that basic stuff. It's not gonna be a full on tutorial, but it'll sort of give you an idea as far as the process and all the different things you have to do to be able to do these images. I think I've gotten a lot better at this since the last time I put up one of these videos. And I definitely think there's still a ton of improvement room, but generally speaking, I think this is a ton of fun. And I'm having a ton of fun with this hobby and I want to share it with all of you. If you want to see something more tutorial like with this, uh, let me know in the comments below. I'd be happy to put the good old people do a arm spin on it. Anyway, what we're going to start off with is showing you what we've upgraded and how we've upgraded. And to do that, we'll start with the original telescope that we have. So I'm sure as most of you remember from some of the first videos, this is the bad boy right here that took some of my first images that I was able to obtain of space. Uh, I took some planet images and all sorts of stuff with it. It was doing a great shift. It put in a good amount of effort, but it's nothing special as far as telescopes go. And I was beginning to outgrow it. So then you'll probably remember that I went ahead and picked up this sucker right here, a Canon EOS RP. So this is a mirrorless camera, full frame with a 24 to 105 millimeter kit lens on it. Um, and yeah, I've gotten a lot of good pictures out of this one. I can't remember, honestly, if I put any videos up with this, but you'll see some pictures that we're taking with it throughout this video, and I'll show you how I set it all up and all that different stuff. But anyway, this is my first foray into like a real full-on camera. I've always used just like cell phones and stuff since then, or before this rather, and uh, it really is spectacular. Absolutely love this thing. And uh, yeah, definitely worth the purchase. So how the setup would literally work is all I would do is take off the telescope and on top of the telescope mount, you can see right here that there's a place to attach a camera. Camera would go right on top, on top of that little nub right there, pretty straightforward. Now that setup of putting the camera on top of the telescope and pointing it around and taking pictures and all that worked pretty well. I mean, you've probably seen some of the pictures over on my Instagram if you're following me over there or right here on the YouTube channel community tab or even in my Discord server. It worked pretty well. I got a bunch of good pictures, but it had one major drawback. And that drawback was that it was not tracking the stars. So if I wanted to take a picture of something, I had to take hundreds, even thousands of pictures of the same thing over and over and over again at like two to three second exposure times, stack it all together and get an okay image. And you're gonna see the before and after, it's gonna be like night and day here in this video, I promise. But anyway, um, I needed to find something to upgrade so that I could track the stars with the rotation of the earth and be able to take longer exposure images, gather more light and take better pictures. And the answer to this was to get a star tracker and the star tracker I ended up settling on is the Skywatcher Star Adventure 2. And this thing is awesome. Let me tell you, I was skeptical when I bought this. I didn't think that I would enjoy spending $400 on a thing that would just twist and turn slowly with the night. But let me tell you, it has really, really dramatically improved my pictures. And I think there's even more room for improvement. But anyway, let's go through the sucker and show you how it works. So basically what we have here is a carbon fiber tripod that I had to go ahead and buy to put this sucker on top of. It has an angular wedge mount here. And this little wedge, I go ahead and point at the angle of Polaris. You then have the motor head itself with a bunch of different speeds that you can adjust to. So for the most part, I use the star tracking one. But if I'm doing solar imaging or lunar imaging, or if I'm taking pictures of all sorts of other different stuff, there's a ton of different options to select from to choose as far as what you're gonna take a picture of. On the back side, you have a removable cover that is a polar aligning scope, which I'll show you how it works in a little bit here during the video. This back cover comes off to show four AA batteries that you can plug in, or you could have a remote power source right here on the side. So you can plug into that little charging port right there. You have Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere for tracking, and you can also use an auto guider sort of plug in there. You then have a mount bracket here with a counterweight off to the left, and you put a camera ball head mount on top to attach your camera to. And yeah, that's pretty much the whole idea. So basically what happens is throughout the night, as the stars continue to rotate, this whole head rotates, and your camera will rotate with the direction of the stars. So after I picked that thing up and learned how to use it, I figured it was going to be smooth sailing. Just take my camera, stick it in the top up here, point it at whatever I'm looking for, click the button and walk away. But I learned it is not that easy. The first problem I encountered throughout all of this was finding out that up here in the north, when it starts to get colder, your lens is going to fog up and even freeze up. And I had a lot of problems with that. So one of the first things I had to buy was a little USB powered thermal sleeve sort of thing. So basically all this is is a heater, little heater wire run inside of this and I wrap it around the lens and the lens no longer fogs up. So that solved that problem. This was $20, but then I needed to buy a battery pack because I didn't have a battery pack that worked, which is another 20 bucks. So that was cool. Got it all set up, ready to go. And I went to go take my first long exposure images and found out that my camera's inbuilt timer only let it go for 30 seconds, which was depressing. So I could either take a really, really long picture and have to click the button every single time or take shorter pictures than I really wanted to 
especially after spending all the money on that thing. So then I had to go out and buy one of these, which is an intervalometer. Basically the deal with this thing is, is that I can tell it how many pictures I would like the system to take, tell it for how long each picture is going to last and set an interval between each picture, hit the go button and then walk away inside and drink some coffee. Honestly, this is one that I should have bought a lot earlier and I really didn't know what I was doing. So this sucker for 20 bucks was 100% worth the purchase. So all that happens is you plug this into the side of the camera and it goes ahead and takes pictures automatically for you. Pretty neat and useful. So now that was all well and good and I was taking pictures and having a great time and you're gonna see some of these here later on in the video, but I was limited by one key factor and that was that this camera lens only goes 105 millimeters. To turn the camera world into normal people world, that's basically 2X magnification. So I could get some cool pictures, but it's nothing like what I could see in the telescope. So that left me with a couple more options. I could either find a way to attach my camera lens to my telescope here, but then I wouldn't be able to use the star tracker because the star tracker has a weight capacity of only 11 pounds. Quite the predicament, which meant I was gonna need to upgrade my lenses, but keep it under the weight limit for this thing. And there's a ton of different lens options. And honestly, I'm not even 100% sure I made an even good choice, but I made a choice that made sense to me. I decided to get a lens that is a zoom lens of sorts so that I could range it between a bunch of different options. That way I could still use this camera as a real life camera instead of just being only dedicated to using it for telescopes. So this is it right here, what I ended up getting. This is a 100 to 400 millimeter camera lens. It goes all the way out to 400 millimeters. Absolutely insane. You're gonna see the lunar eclipse footage that I took and you probably saw the picture over on my community tab or over on my Instagram once again. Um, this is the lens that I used to capture that. So pretty cool. This is a 400 millimeter lens. The telescope over here is a 1000 millimeter telescope. So this is about half as much as the telescope is able to provide. But yeah, all in all, this gives me huge range on my camera now, and I'm actually pretty excited about that. It lets me range all the way from 24 millimeters to 400 millimeters, which is about 8X magnification. I've only gotten to use this for the lunar eclipse, but I think you're gonna see it came out pretty darn good, and I'm excited to try it on some other stuff. Now that pretty much covers everything that I went ahead and purchased to take the pictures that you're gonna see throughout this video. We're gonna show you how to set it up now and how the whole setup actually looks out in the field, out in my front lawn. And then we'll go through some of the pictures I took, some of the videos I took, and all the different things that I was able to make so far with this setup. Once again, if you guys want something more tutorial-like rather than just show and tell, let me know. I'd be happy to do it. I'm really loving this. This is a ton of fun. And yeah, anyway, let's just get over to showing you how it sets up at night. And realistically, as far as like physically setting up, there's nothing too crazy. All you gotta do is take it outside, attach all of the parts to it as far as the tracker goes, get your leg height on your tripod to the right height, and get it pointing in the general direction of the Polaris, the North Star. Then it actually gets into the more tricky part where you have to align the angles as well as the direction of the head towards the North Star Polaris. So if I bring up this clip, basically what you're gonna see is me looking at down the little scope piece that I showed you earlier on in the video here. And what you're doing is you look into this and you look to see the North Star, which is the tiny little bright white dot that you see right there. Look down that sucker and try to get it lined up on the ring in the appropriate position, depending on the time of the night that you are using the tool. Now this isn't a tutorial video, so I'm not gonna go crazy in depth about setting up the camera, or all the settings and all that sort of stuff. I kinda just wanna get into the before and after picture so you can see how like much of a drastic improvement this is. So up on your screen right now, you see an Andromeda image that I took back in September. Um, and this was with a 105 millimeter lens. This is 250 images stacked on top of each other. And you have no idea how excited I was when I took this picture. Like, wow, I can see the Andromeda galaxy. This is so freaking cool. OMG, this is the best thing ever, wow. And then, I was able to get all the Star Trek things up and take this picture of the Andromeda Galaxy with the exact same camera settings, except this time with the Star Tracker, instead of taking three second exposures, I was able to take two and a half minute exposures of the galaxy. And I mean, I'm not gonna tell you which one is better because you know, like art is subjective and all that stuff, but I think it's pretty clear. Now this is another before and after that I don't know is entirely fair because one was taken at 50 millimeters and the other was taken at 105 millimeters, but I think you'll be able to see a pretty drastic difference. Here you have the Taurus constellation. So up into the top center of the screen, you'll see like a cluster of stars. That is the Pleiades star cluster. And I went back and took a much better picture of that region in particular while I had made these upgrades. And uh, let me just tell you, I think you can see the difference is absolutely drastic. You can sort of really make out just about everything in this thing. It's not like as good as a Google Images search result that you get from it, but I think being able to see the progression from that first image to this one is pretty darn stunning. And as far as star pictures goes, I've saved the best one for last. I think this one's absolutely amazing. It's the North American Nebula. This picture took me nine nights to finally get it right. I don't have a before picture because I wouldn't have even thought to even try this one. 
before I bought that star tracker, but man, did this thing come out stunning. This is the background on my cell phone. This is the background on my computer desktop, if you see it. I love this picture. And I think you might too. So yeah, that's it as far as star pictures I've taken since making all these upgrades. Uh, let me know which one you think is the best, but I do want to go on to the lunar eclipse footage from the other night as well now. And I'm going to start by prefacing this saying that it was incredibly cloudy the night. You can see in this video clouds rolling in and covering over the moon. I didn't get a lot of cool pictures. I wanted to take like a time lapse of it and have the whole thing taken, but I didn't live in a great area for that. But fortunately, right when the eclipse was at its maximum, the seas parted, the skies parted, and I had clear skies for about 15 minutes to get some pretty sick pictures. So here's the overall stacked picture that I took right here. I think it came out pretty good. And then some footage you've seen playing here of various points of throughout the eclipse where the breaks in the clouds were enough for me to actually take some footage or pictures.